We have Carrie Palsman, who is a senior foreign service officer with 30 years of experience in public health, two-thirds with USAID. She has served in six USAID missions covering health, education, and capacity development, including in South Africa, Afghanistan, India, Iraq, and the regional mission for Central Asia and Russia. She, uh, she received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale and a Master's of Public Health degree from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. I, I can tell you my favorite food and favorite color as well later if you like. That's a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, from the little bit of the last session I could hear, this certainly sounds like it's been an incredible day. I know our senior DAA was here to welcome you all this morning and kick off. And let me tell you, I wish I could have been here with you um, for the whole event. Um, but luckily, uh, I'm able to rapidly absorb what happened today through some of the tweets that came out throughout the session. So I'll just share some of those with you. Um, hashtag health systems cannot be hashtag resilient if hashtag health workers are not resilient. I'm being a little bit flip and I'll leave out the hashtags, but I think obviously there's a core, core message there about resilience. A tech-enabled health system of the future is possible in fragile and low-income states. We need to think 10 years ahead and invest in the future. Here, here. Resilience requires multi-sector approaches, including defense and security, to address global health security threats, linking sectors so real-time data and info is shared. Some great tweets here. Community engagement throughout the year, not just at the time of outbreak. Community engagement. I know that's music to a few people's ears in this room. An efficient supply chain is critical for access to medicines in times of crisis. Can't just look at resilience from a national level. We must also look at the regional and, most importantly, the local. Trust of the population in the health system is an important part of successful responsiveness to Ebola in a decentralized environment. Again, going back to the community and the key role that they play. What is the comparative advantage of private providers in building health system resilience? A great question, and presumably you all came up with the answer today. Even good health systems can collapse under shocks. The ability of systems to adapt, and that was in all caps, adapt, to political and social contexts, the local disease profile and other pressures is vital for stability, security, and health system resilience. And finally, um, and I'll just out Kelly Saldana for this one, when we assess health system resilience, we need to look at the intersection of pressures of supply, demand, and unique country contexts on the health system. So again, I encourage you all to check out the stream of tweets that have emerged today, and I think there are several consistent themes um, that I hope to touch upon uh, with my remarks. Um, I think today's event has explored systems resilience as an emerging characteristic from improved system performance. In many middle and low income countries, there is still a need to improve routine performance of the health system to ensure it is meeting the needs of the population. As we reflect on the role that resilient systems play in helping countries achieve self-reliance in the health sector, we must also remember that resilience itself is transcendent across efforts to foster country self-reliance. The journey to self-reliance in health is a function of each country's capacity and commitment to create optimal health systems in partnership with public and private sectors, civil society, community and faith-based organizations. And I think that has clearly been a theme throughout the dialogue today. Resilience programming should reduce the gap between business as usual and establishing stronger systems that can absorb and respond to a shock at any scale. This resilience dividend can have short and long-term economic and social benefits at the individual, community, and national levels. When people feel secure in their well-being, including their health status and that of their families, 
because they know they can get the care they need in ways they trust without paying too much or traveling too far for that health care, they are able to turn around and invest back into their community. Taking a systems perspective for resilience helps remind us of the interconnections between the various parts of the overall development portfolio. USAID recognizes that engagement of non-health sectors, including finance, trade, agriculture, governance, and rural urban development, among others, are essential to health sector resilience. I gather that this also was another theme of today's event and that you heard from many sectors, including in the last panel. Systems resilience cannot be achieved in silos. It needs to be a multi-sectoral, whole-of-society approach that encourages engagement from the public and private sector as well as civil society. And we hope this discussion today has helped to illustrate and reinforce this point. Our colleagues in, who work in food security help to ensure individuals and communities are resilient in response to changing life events and environments. Our colleagues who work in the humanitarian assistance arena remind us of the importance of resilience and the devastating effects on individuals and communities when they are vulnerable. And I think we just need to pause and acknowledge the crisis happening in Mozambique, and I presume that's also come out in your discussions today and where we are with responding and helping to rebuild that to be a resilient health system. The global health security agenda provides a framework for systems resilience in the face of disease outbreaks and other emerging public health threats, such as antimicrobial resistance. State Department and other colleagues help us to understand the many different sources of vulnerability that may impact how a person will interact with the health system. Colleagues from academia have helped provide a framework for putting together and understanding these various perspectives that inform how we work to address these systems challenges. Finally, civil society reminds us that on the ground and frontline actors when equipped with timely and accurate information and resources, can bounce back from almost anything. Empowering consumers and facilitating active community participation in policy decisions and service delivery are essential components of efforts to build resiliency. Foundations and donors like USAID may work in all the pieces needed for resilience individually, but we acknowledge that it can be challenging to approach the system holistically when there are competing outcome priorities that are associated with element-specific funding. Today's meeting has brought these pieces together through a systems lens. We hope that the discussions have been useful and thought-provoking to you. We also hope that the shared understandings discussed today will enable, enable better coordination in the future to strengthen systems and improve resilience in order to help make countries more self-resilient. I also hope that the tweets were informative and useful. Thank you.